it. Okay. Um, so just to set a little context, um, with everything that's that's happening at the moment, um, you know, we're unable to have the live collective experiences that we are used to having. Um, and we were thinking about what the alternatives, what alternatives there are for circus that can satisfy the different needs that we have, you know, the need for community and for generosity, the need for assembly, the need to watch circus, uh, the desire to learn and the desire to create and develop new ideas. Um, there's an importance in the moment that we have at the moment and we want to have a group dialogue about what might be useful and meaningful at this time but also to consider what impact it's going to have on the future in terms of the thinking that we have now what resources it might generate that can help us uh, long term um, i'm thinking in particular in relation to our conversations about sustainability environmental sustainability um, so this is just a space to talk. Um, we've invited a few people who've been doing some interesting things that we think uh, will form a really good provocation for the conversation, but it's not a panel talk, okay? So we're hoping that everyone will contribute and, and share ideas and it can be a thinking space um, because I think we all have expertise and ideas that when they meet fluidly uh, will potentially reveal some interesting things. Um, the way that this conversation is going to work is in a second we're going to um, go around um, and ask people just to introduce themselves and say their name and that's for anybody who is uh, visually impaired in the group to be able to have a, a, a voice and a name to go together um, and then I'm going to go to uh, a few people who we've specifically invited who've been doing really interesting things and can share um, what they do and maybe some thoughts and provocations and questions that will feed the discussion. Then I'd like to go around the group and just invite anyone who has, uh, in addition to that, a comment or a question relating to the, the topics to, to, to share. Um, and if you could do that by raising your hand so that we can come to you so that we can share. Um, and once we've done that, we're gonna have a lot on the table that's our food and we decide what we're going to eat first as a group um, and just kind of work through it. In my mind there are two main areas there's this idea of how we kind of um, replace the collective experience which I guess is around performing um, and, and learning and there's a space where we talk about how we continue to create and if that's necessary and needed even. Um, but yeah that's the frame okay so should we go around and just um introduce ourselves and i'm gonna let claire unmute people in okay so uh, i'll start and then i'll go around in order of the windows on my screen so my name's claire and i'm the general manager at upswing and we'll go Hello, um, my name is Amelia. I am a blind performer and academic and circus human. <laughs> Good. Um, I'm Mark Moreau and I am a former uh, circus performer. I perform with a few of you. Hi, Lynn. <laughs> and, um, uh, and for the last 15 years or so, I've been working mostly uh, in photography and video, documenting and promoting circus. And I've been thinking a lot about exactly this question. How do we, how do we do it? Yeah. Raphael and Summer at Double Take Cinematic. Hello, everybody. Hello. Um, we are the circus company Double Take Cinematic Circus. We are circus acrobats and we are also filmmakers. We've been doing a lot of um, promotional material for circus artists, uh, show captation, trailers, demo, etc. And we also do circus movies. 
like short movies and the long term goal is to one day do a feature film, a circus movie. And we're, our base is, again, we're still performers, so we haven't given up our life on the stage. And, but for the last three or so years, we've decided to kind of dedicate a lot of our time to the filming uh, industry. And it's really interesting because we recently decided, okay, we're gonna put the video stuff on the side, we're gonna go back to the stage, and poof, COVID-19, so, ah! So we definitely find uh, this to be a really interesting moment because uh, we can use this moment to collaborate and try to find solutions to help us figure out, do we jump back to video for a while, then to come back to the stage, or, so, voilà. that's us. <laughs> Uh, now to Rachel Clare. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Clare, Assistant Director of Crime Out Loud, normally based in Somerset House, but yeah, in West London at the moment. And Lissy. Hi, I'm Lissy from Member. Um, I am interested in the discussion today and interested in yeah, the creation and kind of audiences and also we're launching our um, youth programme this evening over Zoom and kind of getting participants for that has been a really interesting experience. Muted. Catherine? Hello, uh, I'm Kat. Uh, I'm a circus and theatre director and I run a small company called Can't Sit Still. And uh, I also teach movement on the degree programme at Circa Media in Bristol. Amy. Hello, uh, I'm Amy. Um, I uh, am co-director of a small circus company called Lavrac, along with Nix. Um, uh, we're Bristol based um, and I also work part time for Flying Fantastic. Aiden. Hi, uh, my name is Aiden. I'm Irish, but I live in Sweden. I have a small circus company under my own name, um, which I have a touring show at the, at the moment. Uh, but I also run the upper secondary school at Circus Circar, as well as teaching on their courses. I run the whole school. So at the moment I'm coaching all of the teachers and the students online rather than in real life. Um, as well as trying to manage my upcoming so-called tours during the summer. So I'm very happy to be here and <laughs> be part of the conversation. Thanks. Uh, moving over to Claire Crook. Hi, uh, I'm Claire Crook. I um, am an aerialist and circus theatre performer and maker based in Sheffield. Oh, and a rigger as well. Uh, Francesca. Hi, um, I'm Fran. I'm a circus artist. Um, I have a small company called Collective and Then, um, and we're working on a, a kind of distance project together um, in place of the um, not distance project that we would be doing right now. Um, and I'm also a master's student at DOC and I'm writing my thesis. Um, so I have plenty of time to do that. Jo. Hi everyone, um, I'm Joe. Um, I run a small um, community circus company in Birmingham called Circus Mash. Um, and I'm very in development of education and learning and um, technique and movement and, so, and, and how all that fits together. Great. Uh, Lee. Hello, my name is Ethan Yen. Uh, I'm Cardiff based performer. Uh, rigging technician and trainer. Uh, um, uh, usually we're working with state, um, but then make my own uh, solo work as well. Um, kind of interested at the moment because I'm in the middle of a creation for a solo show. Um, so kind of yeah, it's how that fits into the current world. Great, uh, Kate Webb. Hello. Hello, um, I'm Kate from um, Circa Media. I'm a senior lecturer at Circa Media and doing quite a lot of development for Circa Media at the moment. 
And um, one of the things I was supposed to be doing was um, supporting students doing their ensemble pieces at the end of their second year of their foundation degree. So uh, I'm really interested in this conversation in um, uh, how to support those students to create an ensemble piece of uh, digital performance, but also moving forwards, how to support students, um, whatever the future may hold. And second Kate, Kate Harcock. Oh, hi. So lovely to see everyone. Um, I'm Kate Hartog. Um, uh, I'm director of um, Circus City Festival, which is a biannual festival that happens in Bristol. We just did our third edition um, in 2019. The next one will hopefully be in 2021 in autumn. Um, we, a few months ago, we started looking into an idea about um, sharing new work, so showcasing new work digitally um, so I'm hopefully going to talk to you about that soon. And over to Charlie in your lovely sunny garden. <laughs> yeah it's very nice out here. Hey I'm Charlie, I'm an acrobat and sea wheel artist and I have a little company called uh, Berlin Methodical Troop with a couple of buddies. Uh, Nicole? Hi, I'm Nicole or Nix. I'm the other half of Lab Back Circus with Amy. Sherry, hi Sherry. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Sherry. I am I'm the well everyone most people know Camille. I'm Camille's maternity cover, working with Vicky and Claire at Upswing. And, and Lynn, finally. Hi, so nice to see people's faces. <laughs> uh, I'm Lynn, I'm from Circus Works, which is the UK Youth Circus Network. I'm also on the board of ICO, which is the European Youth Circus Organization. Um, my interest in this is uh, all of the online, online teaching that's happening, uh, which in one way is fantastic, but in another way, uh, I've got safeguarding issues with some of the stuff that's happening so I'm concerned about safeguarding and quality um, yeah physical safety um, and also interested in looking at how to keep um, youth circus local so really keep engaging with the kids that uh, they're working with locally and also opportunities for more engagement so many kids sat in their rooms uh, the sales of circus equipment has apparently have gone through the roof, the retailers are selling us. So loads of kids interested in getting into it. So I'm interested in how we can engage those kids going forward. Great. That's everyone, Vicky. I'm going to mute myself. Over to you. Right. I'm unmuted. My favourite position. Um, so I thought it might be really useful to have a few kind of provocations from people who were who've been thinking about this area for for a while or have done really interesting and exciting things in in the short term so i wondered if we could start maybe with um actually charlie i'm going to start with you if that's okay yeah so uh i'm going to unmute you beautiful there we go. Awesome. um so yeah at the beginning of this Kind of situation i like chatted to lots of other contemporary circus kind of companies and acrobats that are in similar positions about having tours cancelled and things like this and uh, we talked about the idea of maybe setting up a platform online where we could uh, put up our shows uh, the, the recordings of our shows and uh, allow people to donate a small well, donate what they want uh, to be able to rent and stream the show for um, a limited amount of time. So we started that up. Um, we called it Netflix, which was a, a pretty snazzy name. We were pretty happy about that name when that came. Um, and yeah, it's very tricky because we've had lots of people saying how, uh, you know, it's the death of the death of live performance if we start putting all of these online, which is an incredibly dramatic response, I think, um, when we're talking about the death of many thousands of people in the world for this thing. Um, it's gone really well and we've we're kind of plotting around to lots of different uh, corners of 
the contemporary circus world. We started with lots of people that have a big following to gather kind of an excitement around it. And then we will kind of spotlight different um, smaller companies that, you know, we've all passed through in, in these circuits. We all pass amongst lots of other companies. Um, and it's nice to be able to share audiences and build audiences together. Um, there is problems with, you know, some companies have beautiful recordings of their films, with three, four camera shoots. For example, our company, we don't do that. <laughs> and we've, that's been a real sadness for us because we'd like to put our work out there. We have this finished product, but it's an archive footage, um, one camera shoot. And that's really disappointing when people rent that as well. So that there's a little wrestle in there of, we decided it's better to put up work um, regardless of the quality because because um, it's better than nothing at the moment we thought so so yeah it's going really fun people can donate what they want 90% of the um, of the proceeds go to the company and 10% we are donating to the Palestinian Circus Festival and the circus school sorry and the, the kind of beautiful work that they do some companies have donated all of their money to the Palestine Circus um, School, which is really great. Others are donating to the choice of, uh, I think Brussels refugees got a big lump sum from back pocket and stuff like this. So it's really nice. People are really enjoying being able to donate for 59p or the first week we had somebody donate a hundred dollars, which was really great. So just giving the option to people to do what they want and then we can just share what we love doing. Thank you, Charlie. That's really fantastic. And it's just really interesting to see the thinking around the opportunities that you've, uh, you, you've been doing there, like the sharing of audiences and kind of building a bit of a following. Um, we're not going to jump straight into questions for Charlie, but please kind of start with thinking about what you want to talk about that that's provoked for you and just log that because we're going to have a discussion about this. But um, moving on from Charlie, I'd like to jump on to Mark, because I think that'd be a nice uh, follow up. Right, it's really interesting. I, um, I, I can't stand watching shows that are uh, filmed um, and then streamed. Um, I have real difficulty with it, uh, because it, for me, it completely loses the liveness. Um, you know, I film a lot of shows, uh, not only circus shows, but I've also worked as a camera person for MT Live and for Royal Opera House Live. Um, and can I just have a show of hands of anybody who's watched any of the MT Live stuff that's streamed recently? Okay, just a couple of you. And has anybody ever watched any of the Royal Opera House stream stuff? Okay, so that's just Charlie and, and Rachel. Okay, so there's a, I just start with, with, with the, there's a real different approach between the MT and the, and the Royal Opera House with how they do things. The Royal Opera House, they really hate to, to, to have things interfered with. Um, they just want the guys to turn up with cameras and point them at the stage and film the show. Um, the MT are really, really buy into trying to make their shows live for the camera. Um, and, they, and when they're broadcast, of course, they are broadcast live. And for me, this is, um, and so they, they rehearse it. They spend a week rehearsing for the camera. You know, they really invest in, in that broadcast, in that moment of broadcast. And that's what it's meant for. It's meant for that moment. Um, what I'm really, what really disappoints me, what, what I find difficult is the loss of liveness. Um, and, um, and, and the things, the spontaneity that comes from liveness. Um, when I record a show, you know, when I film a show for a company, um, often there might be things that they don't want in it so that they'll go, well, that was a mistake. Can you edit that out? Um, uh, that kind of thing. Um, whereas with, with, with a live, with, a, with a live show, whether that's streaming or whether that's you, you know, in the theater, you get it warts and all. Um, so there's kind of a, a, a lack of editing, um, a, a risk, um, that, that you get from liveness that you simply don't get from, from recording. Um, so what you know, what I'm investigating now is how can we do live performance for you know for the camera um, within the confines of the the social distancing and so on and so forth of this of this virus. Um, yep, uh, I think that's probably what just all I want all I want to say at the moment. Okay. 
Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. And I, I just want to reiterate that in this space, there's going to be stuff that we disagree on, and that's that's okay. You know, as long as we um, we, we talk it out, I think that's it's going to be the interesting point of friction and where we discover um, where we all sit and what the purpose of what we're doing is actually. Um, keeping along the same lines of thinking about how um, work is captured, I'd like to move to double takes and more if that's okay. Um, it's a very interesting subject for us because we've been thinking about all these questions before. Uh, long before the, the confinement and uh, the whole uh, situation that we, we are now. Um, we've been, basically what we do is we study the characteristic of circus and we study the characteristic of cinema and we, we try to cross one another. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is that uh, circus under the camera, or you can call it digital circus, and live circus, they are not two things that, that should fight one another. It's, for us, it's just two different spaces for circus, for, for to, circus live. To, to live, just like circus under Big Top is one thing and circus in theater is another thing. One is not better than the other, it's just two different spaces for where, circus for, where circus can express itself differently under um, with different tools um, for 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 us digital circus it should not try to replace live circus it's just another form of circus where you can explore different different things um, surely there are things when we're talking digitally that you can can do that you can't do live. There are different angles a uh, public can have and see that you can't see live. And so we need to draw on, on these unique things that, that the public ha can play with these different perspectives that they can't normally have live. Like it's not the way, it's, it's what, what Raf said, it's not to replace one or the other, it's just to view it in a different light, in a different way, from a different angle and, and to bring the prowess still to the table somehow. Mm -hmm. Like, it makes you think about what is circus, what are the characteristics of circus? The, uh, the, the prowess, can, can the prowess just be on the acrobats or can it be on the way to film, on, on the way to edit? Um, is it still circus without the, the, the life parameter? Is it still circus? Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's a, those are really, really interesting questions about where the um, where the directorial, where the where the, the skill is seen um, versus film performance and and live performance. Um, uh, and okay. can I say one other thing, Vicky? Of course. Um, and of course, I I'm kind of with Mark too. And um, there's always this thing of quality you know and we can't at this moment in time we we can't always control the the equipment that the people have it's it's just impossible to ask everybody to have a gh5s on, on hand like it's just it's not <laughs> it's too expensive it's not practical but um it's the the times that that we're living in and and how we can maybe educate the students uh, that are in circus school so my question is is part of a circus student's education is it is it nice that they actually start to learn how to properly promote themselves maybe how to use a camera when they don't have the financial means to 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 get the support exteriorly or like is this should be a subject for the students just to learn how can i better promote myself what material do i actually need in terms of graphics and and design and and I'd like to re-say, uh, and, and then after I'll let the, the, the speech. For us, it's, it's very important that digital circus is not meant to replace normal circus, but just to think it about another place where we can express ourselves. And we, voila, that's it. Final statement. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, 
that's great that's fantastic um i would love to move over to amelia if that's possible thank you am i unmuted yeah okay so um, one of the things I forgot to mention in the things that I do is that my partner and I run uh, co-run a company called Quiplash and we're not, we're more theater based. So we're not circus with a capital C, but because I do circus, there's always a little element of it in there. Um, and one of the many things that we do is around uh, platforming, accessible shows, platforming deaf and disabled people, as well as queer people, and kind of looking at the intersections of, of all of that. And so with this um, coming from actually probably more the queer community than the disabled community, I'd say at this point, what I've noticed from where we're sat is that we've had a huge, well, not a huge, a fair amount of people that have really scrambled to just do something, to just kind of keep themselves present and relevant, probably out of a sense of anxiety and a desire to keep going more than anything. Um, mixed with that is uh, a rhetoric that happens in these kind of digital shows that say the drag performers we watch are doing or whatever, um, and in the kind of societal kind of just sort of ether in general around what health is and what access is that I find really interesting and a bit troubling. So the digital stuff, people keep saying, is, you know, it's, oh, it's, 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 it's accessible now. Isn't it wonderful that things are accessible? And what they mean is people can watch it in their homes, um, which for a lot of, say, wheelchair users, that's absolutely true. Suddenly they don't have to contend with, um, from an audience perspective at least, trying to get into an inaccessible venue to view a show. But that depends on uh, what kind of, technology people have, which is related often to people's income. And for sensory impaired people, there's just not anything happening at all right now. So one of my big questions, and this is a, a really new world for me because I've only ever really worked in and only ever been interested in working in live spaces. Um, oops, oh God, sorry, my cat just jumped onto the computer. <laughs> Hello everyone, this is Noodle. Um, uh, so yeah, as I was having a very serious conversation. Um, so yeah, one of my kind of questions is about what is access, who gets to be in the digital room with everyone and how do you do that? So one of the things that I've been doing just because um, it helps my own brain to just have tasks to do in the midst of all of this is I've been as my drag character running um, accessible workouts for people. So I have a BSL interpreter that I split screen with on Instagram. Um, I audio describe the things that I do as I go. I um, have figured out how to put captioning on Facebook as well. So like there's, there's stuff where my stuff is very much geared towards sensory impairment as much as possible because from what I can tell, nobody else is doing that. Um, and then from the uh, quiplash side of stuff, people who know us as consultants are coming to us going, how do I make my digital show accessible? And my short answer is, I have no idea because um, as you know, everybody has been saying, the digital world is a very different thing. It has different rules. So things like audio description, especially if you're working with pre-recorded stuff, the way to go about it is really different. And so like, you know, for example, the way we tend to set up audio description in, say, a cabaret club would be that um, if, the, if the event doesn't have a lot of money, we'll get audio describers to just plump them, plop themselves right next to the visually impaired people and whisper in their ear. And because you have the live sound around you, you can get away with kind of talking over music and talking over a little bit of speech and stuff like that and usually pick up both things. If, all of the sound is coming out of one device and that's happening. It's really kind of impossible to listen to and know what's going on. So the rules are really different. And um, so we've been deferring to someone we know who does say audio describing for like ITV because she actually works in that realm. But what you lose, as Mark was saying, was kind of the, the liveness of it um, a bit. And it becomes, the description becomes a really different thing and it doesn't, I guess I, one of my things is like, so my, yeah, so my two things are that like, one, stuff isn't being talked about around disability properly, surprise to no one, I'm sure. Um, and two, I kind of like, I'm, I'm worried about 
uh, the access stuff that has been in live spaces that has been really innovative, losing its kind of radical, raw, creative form a little bit and falling back into a sort of functionality that is useful but limited. So um, I don't really have any answers to it as of yet, but that's those are my main questions, I think. Okay. Thank you very much, Amelia. That was fantastic. Okay, lots of questions that have come out of there. I hope we're all holding those because we will be able to unpick this all um, in a few minutes. But next, um, I wanted to go to Joseph. Is that okay? Yeah, so hi, everyone. Um, I'm Joe. I, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I come a little bit more from learning as opposed to watching. Um, so I run a school in Birmingham, um, a community circus. Um, so we kind of almost, as soon as we closed down, we thought, well, what next? How do, how do we, how do we um, move forward? We've done a little bit of digital thinking um, pre-closed uh, down, but it was almost like we changed overnight. So we got the team together and we said, how do we work for you? So a lot of our classes have gone online. There's a lot of online learning. Um, Lynn said earlier on about the safeguarding and the safety and, and what we can do as a live person uh, versus what we can do digitally is very different. So that's kind of being managed every week. And there's, there's a lot of challenges that are coming out of that each week, which we're trying to combat and, and figure out as we go. Um, but our digital journey, or I say journey, it's thinking, I suppose, started about 18 months ago. Um, I do a little bit of web development in, in another head. So I had, had I'd always been interested in how we can kind of use tools digitally in a circus world to aid, um, not learning, I suppose, but more so thinking and thinking outside of technique and movement and storytelling and, and, and for everything else. And also kind of what are the life things that, you know, how, how does life feed into circus and how can we use the digital world to do that? So we started thinking and we pulled together a, a group of our, so we have about students at Circus Mash and we pulled together about 50 of them at the start in point and said, what do you want? What do you need? What are you not getting? There's, um, and from that conversation came a lot of things that were just thrown into a pot. And then as we move through the next 18 months to today, really, we kind of started to think about a digital platform um, that allowed people to um, set goals um, and, and track their learning, not only necessarily for their own development, but also for our development as a company and the teachers within the company. It's very hard for when we've, we've got, you know, around 20 teachers and they all teach in their own ways and, and they have their own philosophies, which is fantastic because the students get a really broad range of, of, um, of opinions and, and, and uh, which, is, which is the special thing. However, as a, somebody who was running the school, there was a lot of inconsistencies and there was a lot of things that we found challenging from people coming to us from a student perspective, as well as the kind of the whole conversation around what are we teaching you? Because technique is one thing, but it's one small thing in a, in a long line of other things that we, everybody needs something a little bit different. And it was very hard to put on one class that we called beginner aerial and kind of met all of those needs. So, so we started thinking, yeah, um, to create this platform. So um, we, we, there's a few collaborators on this project. Um, there's, it's very much at Circus Mash. But as we kind of went further down the line, we realized actually this could be a tool that can help a lot of other people as well. So we're, we're at a point now where in June we'll be ready to kind of have a little test of this, whatever it is we've created. Um, we'll kind of go from there, but it's very much a collaborative effort between our teachers, artists that we know from the community, a digital marketing company. And, and we've kind of, yeah, threw lots of ideas on the table and started picking them off one by one. And uh, yeah, so... And I'm trying to think now how what we're doing at Circus Mash as we've closed down and put everything online meets this digital thing that we've started to think about. And there's that there's some connection there that needs to, to happen. But yeah, that's a little bit about what we're doing. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Joe. That sounds really interesting and like a lot of work and um, thinking has already gone into that. Just a quick question. That's, that's the app runs alongside your regular teaching or is it designed to replace your regular teaching? 
I think what this tool is, is absolutely not a place to learn circus. It's to aid the thinking. So it is in conjunction with both. So uh, yeah, like everybody else, I think we all share the same. It's not to replace any, so you can't learn circus digitally, really ever. Um, but it, it can help aid those, the thoughts that, you know, we all need to think about outside of class, you know? Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Joe. I'm going to jump lastly to Kate, uh, who's been working on something interesting around presenting work. Hi. So, um, yeah, we started thinking a few months ago about, um, about shaking. Getting annoyed with, hello, can you, oh, what, do I have to undo myself? Can you no, hear me? Fine. Just pause okay. for your back. Oh, yeah, so my internet might be a bit dodgy. Um, I just basically ended up saying to Adrian Berry at Jackson's Lane quite a few times, can you just um, live stream me some shows? Because I spend all day going to London and it costs money and um, just started thinking about how useful it would be to be able to see shows as a programmer remotely programmers are used to seeing low quality video and trying to assess a show for an audience on the back of that video so personally you know i, I find i think there's a difference between circus for screen like dance for screen work that's made for screen that can be really beautiful but i agree also with mark sometimes that that watching um, shows that have been filmed can be quite uh, sort of heartbreaking. <laughs> what, what I'm used to doing is watching shows that have been filmed with the idea of then taking them to uh, bringing them to live audiences. So what we're thinking of doing is just setting that up but but in a showcasing way so that we're not we're not looking at digital distribution of, of performances what we what we're thinking of is a service where or a, a platform a interface whatever where people can show new work it could be a sharing it could be a premiere it could just be a kind of informal showcase but that um programmers you know from all over the world can be part of that um we're going to be looking at maybe live streaming vr with that um as a kind of first interface um, it, it, the idea was kind of came around a workshop that we did with uh, a cluster of organizations in Bristol and it was about it, the idea about expanded performance and the, um, the their main the main premise of this was about liveness and togetherness I think they see a lot of digital lot, not just performance lots of digital thinking that that loses this element of liveness and togetherness so how can we create something and design something that um is is as positive experience for both artists and programmers so we want to look into you know showcasing showcasing can be quite awkward it can be quite risky it can be you know quite it just just quite stressful situation um how can we how can we make a digital um showcasing experience that isn't that or you know mitigates that in some way but then also for programmers you know um how can you maybe create an experience that has where you get to network with the other people who are seeing the show maybe talk to them afterwards so that, that as a programmer you get a sense of liveness so that you might be able to get a I love watching an audience during a show. So if we can design something where you can have a look around and see if other people are watching the show by whenever this happens, um, what the audience reception is. Um, you might be able to do, you know, a, a Q and A with it. Well, you would be able to easily do a Q and A with the um, with the company afterwards, whether that's a text thing or a talking thing. So we want to start doing some thinking about how we can design this in a really useful way and and then and then look at the technology and what works but you know we don't think that the quality of the viewing experience is going to be amazing um but that's okay for programmers and bookers because they're used to that and so what we hope is that this would kind of hopefully fill a bit of a knowledge gap that's happening where work isn't being made it's not being seen it's not being programmed i know people who are tour booking shows for winter and and then spring in europe but no one knows if that will happen but if we can continue 
seeing new work or the stages of new work being made, then um, artists can develop those relationships with programmers. We've got a bit of funding in place and we've applied for more funding from a few different streams. We'll hear from the end of the month. That sounds really exciting. And it feels like kind of like, particularly in circus being presented in a digital space that we have these three strands that we're looking at. We're looking at work that's filmed specifically for the screen and was always aimed mm -hmm. for the screen work that's live and captured on video and, um, but watched at a later date. And this idea of this, how you have a live stream, a live experience, or um, maybe a, a live work that's captured knowing that it's going to be presented um, on the screen. Okay. Um, Yes, double take. Sorry, I, I just would like, I think most of you have thought about it already, but uh, just to, to, I would like to, to just differentiate the different pieces because when we talk about a digital circus, it has uh, different shapes and, and I just would like to say that it's different when we talk about a show that exists already that we just capture on the screen. It is different than an artistic piece that we create just for the, 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 the screen. It is different than a, a class that we do for the screen. And then the goals of the, of the, the video exactly. are also different themselves. It's different to do something to promote your work to programmers. It is different to teach, so to share knowledge, like uh, uh, Joseph was saying, and it is also different just to entertain, to create something just it's for entertainment. Something beautiful, like the dance videos. For us, it's very interesting for us to enter into this market of beautiful videos, but in, in for circus, and not it only be for, for dance, because this is very possible for circus as well. And we hate that that the programmers are used to having poor quality videos because there are good quality videos that also exist. And, and it's, it's a pity that that becomes the status quo. Oh, we're used to getting the poor quality videos and we hope that that can, 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 can be better because this is for us is like the most important thing. It's the most useful tool for the artists and, and if you're looking at hundreds of videos every day and they're all kind of like, hmm, we got to get something to, to pop on the screen for you. So it's our job too. But I just wanted to, to, to say different types of digital circus you can find. Okay. Um, Kate, I see you have your hand up, but before I, before I come to you, I just wanted to check in with the, everybody else. If anybody has a brief uh, thought or question they want to share, on what they've heard so far or on something that they uh, want to bring to the table. Yes, Lissy. Hello, Lissy. Hi, um, so it was takes me a second to unmute. I just wanted to mention that this weekend, this was like a theatre show, so Shakespeare. So it, it, it's not necessarily directly relevant, but I watched a show over Zoom like this. So there was like a hundred people on the call, 10 people were performers. Um, and they were interacting and it was happening in the moment and I could at times see the other audience members and it gave that like liveness that is generally missing from stuff so and I thought it was really interesting um, I'll put a link to it in the chat in a second but I just wanted to share that that there are ways of getting liveness without having to be in the same spot okay I'm gonna go to Lee then uh, Aideen and then Amelia Lee. Hi, uh, yeah, just, just similar, similar -ish to what um, Lissy was just talking about, but also, yeah, really dealing with uh, what Kate talked about, about getting this audience conversation, um, just from a, an experience I had this week. Um, I don't know how aware of the idea of a, a juggling renegade show people are, but it's kind of a juggling convention, very, like, end of the night, after the gala show, after the open stage, after the scratch night, you get the renegade show, generally, at, you know, gone midnight, um, where, you know, people are making stuff on the spot and bouncing off each other, and, um, you know, people are, like, seeing things that other people are doing and diving into them, and, you know, it's, it's 
it's very rough and ready and um uh, I, I was involved in one earlier in the week um which was a zoom call with 40 50 artists all on a zoom call balancing off each other and um bringing stuff that they just made in their living room or like seeing things that other people are doing um and about that kind of you know it really had that live feeling of being able to see the audience that you're talking that you're you're performing with and not that you've got a, a compare or an mc who's who's dealing and managing that space um but i i, I just thought that it, it did have that kind of um live responsiveness um which is is really interesting um and also like allowing artists to stay collaborative and to be able to share a space together, um, which feels like, you know, people are posting videos in, in that kind of asymmetric communication doesn't feel like it's quite filling that space. Um, so yeah, I just want to share that, that experience for the, for the melting pot. I'm curious what other um, adaptations and what other what other disciplines and areas of service can be relevant to. Okay, thank you, Lee. Um, Aideen. Hi, uh, so like, it's been really, really good listening to everybody because of course, as probably most of you are aware, the situation is slightly different in Sweden in terms of what we have to do and what we can and can't do. And in a way, the vagueness is a challenge in itself. Um, but I just had, wanted to just like pitch a few things that I just thought were, like for example, I very much agree with what Mark was saying and then also what, what Charlie is doing as well because one of the main issues that I've been seeing recently is that there is a huge surge in companies uploading um, footage that is archival footage but they're also just putting up for free and I think that like despite the fact that it hasn't been made for camera I think using something like Netflix is less damaging to the sector than putting up a whole show for free because the audience are going to know that your your show wasn't filmed for the camera. So in a way, it's more like giving them the opportunity to give you some money rather than necessarily to give you, or at least I think there has to be a clarity in that as well, because there isn't a way of like expressing it as a live show or something that's made for camera when it wasn't. Um, and I think that like the... I had a thought when we were talking about the difference between live and cinema and circus and big top and theatre. And I thought that one of the things that we don't necessarily have to miss in terms of the future or how we plan it is that part of the liveness that maybe is missing as an audience is the element of risk. And when you know that something's being filmed already and you're watching it not at the same time, then you know that that element of risk is not there. So one of the things that we kind of need to look into as well as, um, as Double Take was saying is this idea of providing a live experience, but via a screen, so making it for the screen. So you still have that element of risk, whether it's through the, the prowess and the trick, the camera or the edit. So perhaps, perhaps the risk isn't always within the trick. Um, and then the other thought I was having was this idea of solo audiences, because that's what Kate was saying about this idea of not being in a room full of other people and feeling that sensation or feeling people start to sweat at the same time as you're sweating. And it's like, <laughs> and that's, uh, with one of the festivals I was supposed to be performing at um, in Iceland, the Fringe Festival, they haven't cancelled it, but what they have done is they've invited all of the international artists to present via crowdcasting. Um, and I've now been looking into that platform as a way of maybe doing the graduation show for my students in a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. because I haven't used it before, but it seems to have a really interesting format that could be really useful for the sector, which is like, um, from what I understand, there's four screens, which are the delivery screens, um, and all of the other screens are receiving screens. So you can have like four screens in different locations, and then the rest of the screens are basically audience screens. And the audience have the option of clicking a button to pay, but it's live. And of course, you can have pre-prepared footage that you can use to like share your screen to show a video clip that's maybe more subtly edited or with better lighting or something. And I just thought I would just put in those two cents. I am actually about to start teaching an online class in about 15 minutes. So I wanted to jump in there because I was very inspired. So thanks so far. Brilliant <laughs> contributions. Thank you. That was, that was really fantastic. Um, I'm going to hand over to Amelia because uh, you had to think. Yeah, it was um, just to say in relation to the, the stuff around um, having, say, like a Zoom show, 
um, it is it is it is that thing that I think a few people keep saying is that it is not the same kind of live. But what is quite I don't know, I'm finding it kind of lovely is that what happens because you don't have as an audience member the capacity to vocally respond when you like something. So even if you know, even if you're watching a circus person do something live, if you're in your house and you go, <gasps> the performer doesn't get that. And most people know the rules of that. So they know that like they need to give the performer that so that they know that they're doing good. So what happens is you get this like chat room circa the early 2000s kind of styly stuff where people are doing all the reactions in the comments. And I both love and hate it because I, I like I, I grew up in that world. And so there's something really uh, reminiscent of my teenage years that I really enjoy about it. Um, the flip side is, as a, as a performer, it's weird because most of the time you don't get to see the reactions until afterwards. So that immediate validation is not there. Um, and also then again, as an access thing, it can get really overwhelming to try and watch the performances. And then if you want to also interact with the comments, do that. Um, but what might be just interesting to think about, both as a, in terms of access, but in general like what that kind of liveness means because it is live and like um again going to the the drag stuff for example which is the world that i'm the most immersed in right now most of them are doing some form of live stream so like um a lot of people are using instagram live which is a little bit problematic because i as soon as you play music that's not yours instagram freaks out um, and thinks you're trying to steal copyrighted stuff and kicks you off and like shadow bans you and all this kind of stuff that's actually really damaging. But then uh, there was another show from a company based, well, I don't, I don't know if they're a company, they're like a collective based in Bristol called Brizzle Boys. And they did a live stream over YouTube. So they were talking, the two hosts were on Zoom and they'd bring the performers in live to chat, um, but then they would show pre-recorded uh, footage. And some people sent stuff that was live and that they'd done before the pandemic, some people had recorded stuff specifically for it. And so the film quality was really varied, but the the liveness was still there. And like, I was one of the performers for that. And it was, it was a wild ride to watch myself do a performance and then watch everybody react while I was like sitting on my couch eating crisps. But anyway, just to, like, it's, I guess that's mainly anecdotal, but I find that stuff very interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm finding chat rooms are an art piece in a, <laughs> at the moment. I mean, do you think there's space for kind of um, thinking about audio description in that chat feature? Um, oop, maybe. Why? My, oop, my, oh, I'm already unmuted. That's why I was making a weird noise. Um, yeah. Um, in the chat feature, probably not. I would say um, that... <sighs> It gets a little bit confusing. Um, so like, I mean, my ideal anyway is always that people think about it as soon as they make a thing and it's integrated into the thing because then you have one thing that you can just hand over and it's there. Um, the other thing that I've noticed that works, seems to work pretty well for um, both British Sign Language and audio description is that you have like one capacity where the performance is happening and then another capacity, say a Zoom chat, where there's a BSL interpreter or a describer. So it does require a person to have two devices, which can be a barrier. But for most, most people, that's, you know, most people have a phone and a computer. So um, you kind of then put the two devices next to each other. And then um, you either have the pre-recorded thing happening and then uh, audio describer or a BSL interpreter um, watching it live with the people who need that access support and doing whatever the access support is. And like uh, for the BSL in particular, it's quite cool because usually I think for a lot of BSL users, if they're watching a live show and the interpreters on the side of the stage, they are doing a lot of kind of, you know, back and forth thing between the two things to try and catch what's happening. Whereas like they have the power to put it in whatever eye line they need. Um, and then, you know, for audio description, like, does, I don't need to see the audio describer and I can't see the other thing. So I can put the you know sound wherever I want to put it. Um, and that's quite nice. So like, um, it's not a perfect solution, but I would err towards that more and still have, even if the, um, the piece itself is pre-recorded, I would still have the live human 
that I can also then interact with and ask questions to because that just makes it uh, easier and also again it brings that kind of element of understanding that the access stuff is an art form in itself mm. and those are creative people that you know one have also lost their work and um, two need an outlet and uh, provide a service that's really integral to the art forms okay all right did anybody else have um, uh, a comment to add in or a question yes Aideen Sorry, I just had like I had this idea because I was um, talking to a friend of mine who works within this, the film industry a couple of days ago, and they were uh, having a big issue with the presentation of a premiere during summer, which didn't want to be cancelled. Um, and I was thinking because like I grew up in a country which is nowhere near Europe, and uh, we had the luxury of having drive-in cinemas for some reason. And I was thinking drive-in cinemas, like as a thing coming into the British summer, is like one of the most amazing ways to have physical distancing and have a live show projected onto a huge wall or a big screen or potentially live on stage in front of you i don't know just wanted to put that in there <laughs> um, i missed out kate before and then i'll come to you rachel oh rachel yeah sorry rachel you have something urgent and pressing so let's go to rachel and then we'll go to kate i'm sorry kate i keep missing you um, no no sorry it's not urgent and pressing it was just I just wanted to make sure you didn't forget me but um anyway sorry I also apologize I didn't actually introduce myself properly at the beginning so for those of you who don't know crying out loud we work with um UK and international artists both um developing new work and touring and we've recently been doing a um piece of research called Circus Snapshot which I know some of you have been part of but my comment was more about um, picking up on what Kate said in terms of this idea that programmers I was I've been a programmer um, for many years as well as um, uh, working with Chronic Loud that I, I don't think it is a, too much of a worry that um, the, in, the initial videos or films are maybe badly made from a technical point of view as long as they are just about getting interest from the programmer because no programmer is going to program or, or consider or make judgment on a film like that. We, it's really a trigger to begin a relationship. So I just sort of wanted to reassure um, Double Take that, you know, most programmers will, will, have, will use those videos as a trigger and then go and see the work live, develop, develop a relationship. Um, and it's certainly something that we've put in our budgets is, is enough money to be able to make a 30 second trailer a 60 second trailer and a 90 minute trailer for all different uses on different platforms and I just think that is actually the sort of way forward in terms of trying to seed interest and because most programmers will want to see the full show live um, but I think what you're doing Kate is amazing the idea of being able to sort of reinvent and repurpose um the way forward with trying to um have like the sort of equivalent of canvas i suppose when we when we had the uk showcase for the circus um the canvas events i think that to try and reinvent that could be really interesting then then the other comment was just i don't know if how many of you are aware that the creative europe um the uh, recent uh, sorry the eu recently uh, published a a paper on circus they did a sort of long survey over a number of years um, and it's worth looking up if any of you it, it, you can just put in EU report on circus and it should spring up but I just thought it's worth quoting that on their executive summary um, there's a innovate they talk about the there's one of the headlines is the inno, in, innovative potential of circ, the circus sector and they identify three things which really stick out from the research. And one of them is the lack of digital engagement with circus. It's not just in the UK, it's across Europe. So it's one of their recommendations is that, um, is that the circus sector needs, and obviously this is complicated for us because we're supposed to be leaving Europe, <laughs> but I just think it's really worth noting that this is one of the main sort of pointers that came and recommendations that came out of the report was was the fact that did the digital revolution can reach new and existing audiences can improve um in the, the possible the potential for innovation in the form so i think what we're talking about is really recognized within that wider european sector and even though we're not going to be part of europe it doesn't that doesn't preclude us really being able to sort of 
carrying on and having conversations and being able to join in research programs that um, that, e that EU hopefully will be will be pushing out or e that the applications to EU. Um, okay. Yeah, we're uh, we're at an early stage, aren't we? All of us. It's not it's not just the UK. So. Thank you, Rachel. Kate. Um, I, w I was just I was going to say that really that um, that if you wait for a company to have have filmed their film their show and edited their show to a point that they're happy with it, it it, it takes away from the, the immediacy of being able to see a show quickly and 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 the timing is quite important because programmers like to program well it takes ages to program stuff and also we like to program things quite early on for various reasons. Um, but I, yeah, I was wondering whether circus for screen is, is a useful term. So for me it is, it makes sense, dance for screen, circus for screen. But um, yeah, that, that, um, Rachel kind of said what I was going to say. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, does anybody have another point? I, I have a, a, a thought from, um, from what Charlie was talking about that I wanted to, to just kind of dig into a little bit, if that's okay. Um, Charlie, I was really fascinated with what you were saying about Netflix because it was a very immediate response to um, to the situation. You know, you didn't have a lot of time to think about it, and you didn't have access to a lot of resources to make it happen. But I'm really interested in what you were saying about the community that's kind of starting to be built around that. And if you could say a bit more and talk a bit more about how that's working and how you see it growing. Um, we need to unmute you. I will give you. There we go. Have you found him, Claire? Is that, am I unmuted? That's yeah. it. I took control of that. Cool. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess it's circus is a community thing as well. You know, it's it's the performance side of it is is just a segment of the life that we lead as circus performers it's the training it's the it's the festivals it's meeting up with people it's um, talking with them after so we were really thinking how we can help that in this tricky time uh, when lots of people are alone and lots of you know perhaps new circus people and, and hobby circus people that are maybe t teetering on should I turn into a professional and then you know this COVID situation happens and they're like no I'm not going to do that anymore I'm going to kind of do something else so it was trying to to gather the community and we were talking about maybe having a and as each um, each kind of on Friday and the Saturday have a QA and a with the company and so that if people have rented the shows and they watch it they can enjoy that we tried that once and it's just so hard in the quarantine to be able to like get multiple sources together and yeah lots of things are tricky in this quarantine um, but that is one of them and that's a shame because that would have been a fun thing to grow and we were talking about maybe you can also rent the show with a commentary from the acrobats or from the artists to, to try and gather more insight and more it's like a little special exclusive that we need to find a, a silver lining to this situation that we're, we're living in at the moment um so yeah it's really tricky and it's been nice to see there is a little excitement built and people are coming back and renting the shows um and hopefully it will introduce you know next week we have a show from taiwan and uh, we have a show from ethiopia and things like that so hopefully it will keep the excitement of the the circus is is the surprise and the oh i don't know what's going to happen and things like that um, but you know it's not a foolproof plan and it's definitely not going to exist when this is all over <laughs> because we can go and watch theater shows but you know we're used to watching shows two times three times a week maybe um so you think once this is over there isn't a space for something like Netflix? I don't think there is not a space for that but that's not my prerogative to uh, mm. continue building that because everyone builds their own audiences and we can definitely go and enjoy <laughs> the live mess of it you know yeah. no one wants to watch things <laughs> on, on, on a little screen <laughs> so easy <laughs> Um, I'm going to pop to Francesca and then I think Mark had a hand raised as well. So I'm going to go to Francesca first. Hello, Francesca. Hi there. Uh, I just wanted to 
plus one uh, on, on I'll pick up on what Charlie was saying about like uh, the community and caring for the community and to add to that um, I think as uh, uh, as a circus artist and as circus artists we're used to having to um, adapt and change and having to innovate and like learn new skills um, and that's the same with the situation and uh, learning how to uh, responds digitally but also there's going to be a whole load of people that don't have the time or the capacity or, or the tools to do that and how do we um, uh, how do we uh, maintain and keep caring for everybody as a community um, and also slightly linked to that um, coming from like a personal practice and um, how do you how do we maintain um, personal practices and, and, and thinking about identity beyond technique uh, and what what else and, and what more can we find from the situation about uh, and, and learn from circus. So if you think, uh, as I kind of think of circus as a, um, the relationship between a body environment and object, which <laughs> it's not my definition, I'm stealing it. Um, but then that allow, that, yeah, that, that feeds me and that allows other things to come out. And I think there's more interesting conversations that can come from that. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to hop over to Mark um, for the, the next comment. Uh, Mark, are you yeah, ready? Just, yeah, I just want to pick up a bit, a bit to go back to, to the concept of liveness and about what I'm trying to do, which is about making live work for the camera. Um, and it's a little bit about uh, repurposing your audience. You know, we all know, all those of us who are performers, you know, we, we're there on stage and we're looking out at our audience. You know, we're, we're circus performers, we're not theater performers, there's no fourth wall between us. You know, we, um, in, um, in the current show that I'm performing with, with Natalie Record, Natalie Inside Out, we, we ask to keep the house lights up a little bit so we can see the audience. You know, we want to be able to make eye contact with them. Um, so, so many of the shows that I record, you know, they're archival recording, they're not made for the camera. I was just watching uh, The Spy Monkey, one of The Spy Monkey's Complete Deaths last night, um, which was a show which I filmed, and I realized they never look at the camera once, um, that they're performing for the live audience, and we are at a remove, you know, we're not part of that. So, what I'm looking at is how I make a show that's a multi-camera show, you know, that, that's filmed, you know, with good quality set, you know, with, with good quality, um, um, using the same, you know, kind of cameras and techniques, the same, you know, kind of multi-camera switching that you would do, but where the performers are performing to the camera is the difference between me here and me here. When I'm really looking into the camera, I'm really looking at you rather than when I'm looking at the screen and we're slightly disconnected. Um, of course, there's this big problem because, you know, how do we keep distance? How do we not infect each other? And I'm really looking now, experimenting with techniques where I can remote control cameras, like you see in the BBC newsroom. You know, when you watch that, you know, you've got the newscaster there. There's nobody else in the studio with them. All the cameras are remote controlled. That kind of technology has come down in price so much um, that it's within my you know, it's, it's within the possibilities of little old me asking for funding for it because, you know, we're talking under 10 grand to, to set all this up. Um, so then you can have, I can have the company in the next room. And I can be in a completely remote room operating the cameras, doing the switching and so on. So it's about, you know, it's about liveness. It's about communicating directly with you. It's about really performing it for you and about maintaining a high technical standard and about keeping the, we're so used to, as watching television. We don't watch one angle, you know, what keeps us, what keeps us engaged is the fact that we are changing angles. We're so used to that cinematic language as, as, as you guys in Double Take were talking about, you know, so bringing that cinematic language um, to liveness uh, and perform it for the camera, not for the audience sitting in the seats. Yeah. Sorry, um, Amelia has her hand up. I'm going to... Um, yeah, I just, um, sorry, there's a, there's a double meeting happening here, so I'll be very quick. Um, but um, I just wonder if, sorry, Al. I can't do it, okay, let me just pause my microphone. Um, I just wonder if there is something about also reframing what we mean by live, 
um, I think like there's a kind of internet term of like, you know, when you meet in real life, IRL, as if the internet or the digital isn't a real thing. And I think there's probably in the midst of all this, something about reframing. It, it's not the same as being face to face with someone, but it isn't, it is, doesn't mean it's not live for even the person watching a pre-recorded thing. So yeah, that's all. Right, thank you very much. Um, we we've kind of talked around the uh the theme of circus for the screen uh, a little bit um there was another topic that we had around learning and education and that kind of um experience on a digital platform is anybody interested in kind of picking up that conversation and, and moving it forward do we have a contribution maybe from lynn yes hi lynn hi uh, um yeah i've been doing lots of thinking around it was really interesting listening to what Joe was saying and the fact that you've been working on it 18 months. I know we, we've had a few conversations already, Joe. Um, but this thing, I think there's the there's interactive and then there's presented work, like we were saying. And I'm really interested in how we can make uh, local circus groups interact on a local level so those kids who are learning from their teachers can still feel part of that class. So I think that a massive part of learning circus and why people go to classes is for the social aspect of it as much as learning the skills. Um, so I'm really interested in how we can maintain that uh, in, uh, in learning uh, in a participative way digitally um, and, and to keep the quality of the classes as well at the same time. Um, Joe, I was... I was um, I don't know if you've seen, I recently watched a, a TED talk uh, on the Khan Academy. I don't know if you've uh, you've seen it, but it was um, really interesting and scary at the same time. And it's very much about using uh, learning digitally uh, but, and making it much more learning centered so that teachers can really track how, uh, t how their kids are learning online. It's much more based around maths and things, but it'd be really interesting. I've started a conversation with a few people in Europe about it because we're doing a learning centered learning project with that so it'd be really interesting to uh, if you had a look at that and to, yeah I'd like to hear your thoughts on it um, I, I'm also I think it would be amazing to get some circus artists uh, interacting with kids at the moment you know there's all this stuff going on on the BBC of you know David Attenborough teaching geography and things like that it would be amazing to get some master classes up and running for kids sat at home, you know, wanting to learn of John Gandini and people like that. And I'm sure, you know, loads of people would be well up for it. So yeah, I'd like to have those conversations as well. <laughs> okay. Um, Kate, you had your hand up. Um, yeah, so um, just in, in, in response to what Lynn was saying, um, so Circa Media's Youth Stack has done a couple of things. They've done the um, Circa Media Youth Circus Home Edition, do try this at home, where all the circus tutors have created little tutorials which then get, um, I think they get broadcast three times a week and that goes out to the youth circus community but also what, you know, further afield. Um, the youth circus were supposed to be having their annual production next week. So um, I think what Jono has done has asked for all the youth circus participants to create little films of them doing stuff at home to send into him and then he's going to create um, uh, videos that get shown um, privately. Obviously you have to um, join the group, um, but, but to the, the rest of the youth circus community every night next week which would have been their show. So they get to see themselves perform with the rest of their, their peers. Um, but also just on that thing of community, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Kat, who's been doing some really great things with the Circa Media um, first year students. So these are coming to the end of their first year, trying to finish off their first year degree, first year of their degree um, and uh, so retention for us is really important and maintaining that community. Kat, do you want to talk about street theatre? Yeah. Uh, so alongside teaching movement, I also coordinate the street theatre module with my partner, Matt Pang. Um, and so we were tasked with teaching street theatre online. Um, and so uh, 
we came up with the idea normally the students would make circle shows and they'd make walkabouts and we'd go and perform them uh, outside um, and so what we decided to do was we were kind of inspired by um, the balcony singing that was happening in Italy and the kind of like mass aerobic workouts that we were seeing in Spain at the time uh, so we decided to set them the task of creating an creating a performance that could happen outside of their house or from the window of their house so it's not a digital performance although it will be filmed uh, but the the idea of that performance is to provoke the local community uh, that are like their direct community I'm talking about their neighbors and people passing by their houses so this is a task that's going to happen in a couple of weeks time and the way that we've been teaching street theater is uh, we've set um, two weeks worth of daily challenges. So um, we looked at what Matt would normally teach in a street theatre class, the exercises that he sets, and we tried to adapt them uh, to be done in this weird world that we're living in at the moment. Um, so they have to film themselves completing these challenges and they started off quite simple. So it was just um, tell us, tell the camera five things that you're good at and, and uh, film yourself doing one of those things. And then we've been building up an intensity. So we also ask them to transform the outside of their space in some way so that it looks different and it catches attention. Uh, very soon they're going to be asked to go and do some daily exercise or do their shopping dressed in a costume. Um, they have to, uh, yeah, there's lots of different things. Anyway, uh, and we set that up as a Facebook group, which is a bit 2018, but that's what we did anyway. And, um, uh, that's been the best thing, the Facebook group. So they all post the videos of the daily challenges on Facebook and then they receive feedback from Matt and myself, but more importantly, they receive feedback from each other and they can also like and love and laugh at each other's videos. And it's that bit that has created this sense of community that I think is, as anyone who performs outside knows, is kind of at the heart of any outdoor arts. Um, so we, yeah, we don't know if we've got it right. It's going well. It's not what I would, you know, it, we're just sort of having to adapt it for the time. So it's not perfect, but it's something that we're doing that, that yeah, seems okay for now. Okay. Cool. Charlie. Yeah, uh, I've been doing a little bit of teaching as well. Some kind of wheel teaching online. And also I, I teach for, a, um, for a school in Switzerland that have an age range for a youth circus school in, in Switzerland that have an age range from kind of four to uh, 20. And so that's been really, and obviously then their English and my French is, uh, you know, has different variables, the different ages. So with the older, with the elders and they have gardens, um, that's been really nice to be able to, to give classes like that. But it's been a really fun challenge to try and utilize this platform and how you can teach kind of, how I can teach children that I can't speak the same language to that maybe don't have a um, garden access that are just in their room and I have them for an hour, what do we do? Um, so we've been having you know, quite fun games of like, everyone turns their lights off and then and we're all on a Zoom screen and then somebody puts their light on and they're in a, a funny position or something and we'll try and like create little snapshots and like do things like that. There's a, there's a really lovely um, like drama teaching technique from, 60s called the mantle of the expert which is kind of immersive learning and so you take the kids through like a quest um, and so that's been really nice where everyone's in their own little quest and you know it's kind of like a Dungeons and Dragons -y thing I guess in the way that it's I'm the dungeon master or whatever and you lead them and you say oh you know the queen has has found these trolls and we need to do we need to go and search for them so let's let's draw a map so everyone is drawing their own map and things like this. And, and then it's like, right, I'll see you tomorrow. You need to make sure you go and find those trolls with your parents on your one hour walk that you do. So then they come back and everyone has fun little talks about that. And so it's trying to kind of utilize this and not, um, yeah, not, not butt heads with the, with the, the technology and just go, okay, right. How can we, which is a wonderful challenge. Um, Taskmaster, I don't know if any of you watch Taskmaster, but they've been doing some fun online things. Um, definitely stolen some of those. Um, Greg Davis and Alex Horn has done some excellent. And what they're doing is they're just creating a silly little community that people can buy into, you know, um, 
just got into, yeah, ha ha, watch other people doing that and then go away. And that's the wonderful thing about the internet. People can jump in, jump out, and it's not for everybody, but if you want it, it's there. And everyone just needs to have that access point, I guess, of if something's there, then they can go and jump in. Um, Amelia, you have your hand up. You want me to move it to like yeah, um, Friday the 8th of oh, May? Sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, just a really quick thing, which is that I, one of the projects yeah. I'm working with, um, a theatre company on making digital stuff for kids for this project that we were supposed to tour that <laughs> is now not happening. Um, and one of the things that a lot of parents are really interested in is getting uh, their kids I away talk? from screen time. Yeah. Um, mm. So within that, there is something about creating a digital thing where the kids aren't sort of like having to be up against a screen. So something that for those that can hear it, can, they can listen to and that kind of stuff. It's also just for people that are in that teaching mode, um, that might be worth just thinking about a little bit. Oh, absolutely. Okay, um, I'm aware that we are coming towards the end of the, the time that we have allocated for this conversation. And this is really like a first um, conversation, a little bit of a, a, a trial to see if there is a, a need and a space and um, to use the opportunity that we have to, to, to have some, some dialogue. And we imagine that there'll be some more of these conversations that we have the resources and capacity to convene these conversations um, around things that people are interested in talking about. So there might be stuff that feels like it's unfinished in this conversation that we need to have a, another conversation about, things that we didn't get to touch on, or things that are actually present and necessary to speak about now that we, we haven't thought about. So I'm inviting everybody involved here to feed back to us about um, conversations they want to have in the future because we'll have some more but for right now I think it'd be really useful to do a little bit of a, a round robin to to bring this to a close to share anything that you think is a, a topic that you want to have a continuing conversation anything that you're taking away from this conversation or any points that you wanted to bring to the dialogue that you weren't able to to bring um I'm gonna go to double take cinema because they uh I would like just to, it's, it's not another subject, it's just to think a little bit about the future. So there's, there's two possibility, either we get out of the crisis and we go back to the normal world, or either we completely effed up and this is the world now and we need just to adapt to it. Um, in the case that the world is like this now and, and we speak through Zoom, until the end of life, I think it'd be nice to, to, to think about a little bit more about, um, how do you say, quality of content and quality of techniques. Like Mark was saying, how do we film? How do we adapt the technology to, to film better, to give better content? How it would be nice to, to imagine a, a Netflix where the shows have been recorded in order to be at good quality, um, yes, to, to, to make content better. And in the, <clears throat> pardon me, in the case that we go back to the normal world, it'd be nice also not to put a digital circus completely on the side. On the side. Again, as, as uh, Rachel was saying, there's a need for and circus Amelia and, and Amelia too, there's a need for circus to be a little more digital, like the, the dance film is very developed. And I feel like in circus, we're really late on this. There's no, uh, uh, we're getting there little by little, mm -hmm. I see you Mark, but, <laughs> but compared to dance, Quite. there's no circus, dan uh, circus movie festival. There's nothing like this. It's not a circus yeah. film category or... Yeah, and, and I imagine circus movie could become a genre of movies, just like musical uh, movie. And, and for now, the only, the only movies we see, uh, the only circus movies, long feature movies we see, they are a bad circus. But the, all the musical, they are not about music. They are just other stories. And another thing I wanted to say um, about digi digital circus killing um, life. life circus, uh, permit me to, I'm 
I disagree on that. If you if you compare it to sport, to soccer, I'm a big fan of soccer. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, it's not. <laughs> It is not because you see soccer on TV that people stop stop to go. Ah. Wait, wait. <laughs> it is not because you see circus on TV that people stop to go to the stadium. It right. it's just different ex experience. And I was a little sad when Charlie said, "Well, when all of this is over, I'm gonna stop doing it." And mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. I want you to. Keep to, going. I want you to keep going because it's, it's it's so nice to have a platform like this for the people that are not used to go to to see circus. Or for those with disabilities. For people that cannot travel. For people in different countries. And I was very excited about all the applications you you talked about to have commentaries of the of the artists and so to 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 make it shorter. In the option we go back in the option this is the world like like that now let's think a little more about quality of content what do we film how do we film it and in the case that we go back to normal life let's keep Evolving. on all these great ideas i, I want to see them even if i don't have to wear a mask to go outside mm -hmm. i think um i think that would be really fantastic i'd love to have a conversation around this idea of circus going digital because one thing we haven't talked about, because there isn't, I guess, the expertise in the space, is around that um, games theory, uh, and and how that can be applied to circus performance. So not just kind of filming and capturing um, an artistic product uh, that has been conceived and made and presented in completion, but something that yes. has an interactive quality. So that would be a really interesting conversation. We'd love to host. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Does anybody, should we just go around and just check in with everybody briefly before we come to an end? Um, maybe let's go uh, Amelia and Mark, Lizzie and then Amy and then I'll continue on. Can I actually go a bit later just so I am less likely to interrupt my partner's meeting? Of course. Mark? Oh, you're I'm still... Switched. Yeah, okay. So it's, it's funny just, you know, um, Thinking, thinking about about this and about liveness and then about about um, making work for the camera. Um, I'm kind of intrigued about what people are doing making work for the camera. Uh, I've seen on Nimbra's Facebook page some little photographs of uh, something going on there of um, some some something being filmed with some acrobats. I don't know whether that's current or whether that's archived, but I'm curious to see the result. Um, but the point that I was going to make was going back to my my late friend and mentor Reg Bolton, um, who whose position was that what makes circus so different from anything else is there is no suspension of disbelief. What's happening is really happening in front of you. It's not a cinematic trick. Um, you're not imagining that somebody's standing on top of somebody's shoulders. That they're really doing it. How do we keep that real? Uh, in a digital realm, you know, how do we remove the digital tricks, um, but keep the, the circus tricks real? Um, yeah, that's a, a question. I, I also want to just say that, um, just from, from what um, Double Take was saying about, about, um, about, about content and, and technology, that there is a trade-off between those two things. Um, and that in the end of the day, I can talk about how much I value good quality technical but on the other hand content in the end is the most important thing um, and more and more I look around at you and some of you are quite fussy some of you are quite sharp but on the other hand I still want to see all that you know I can still see all of you and I can still hear all of you um, you know and what's valuable for me is the content rather than the picture quality okay so that's a contradictory position to take but I'm happy to do that <laughs> Okay, um, very quickly, I'm going to go to Lizzie and then Amy. Um, double take, I know you have a thought, but maybe if you can type it into the comment section. Lizzie, and maybe if we all just unmute ourselves and say, Yeah, I've just okay. unmuted myself, I've gone rogue. Um, thanks so much, everyone. The thing that we haven't talked very much about that I would really like to talk about maybe in the future or member word is like audience and participants. We're reaching different people online than we do in real life. And that's sometimes a little bit of a shame in some respects. 
um, for our take-up of our online youth programme today, uh, only like 30% of the take-up are from low-income families, whereas when we're teaching on the estate where we normally teach, it's like 70%. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe that for a future conversation, but thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, definitely logged for a future conversation. That's a really important one. Okay, Amy? Hi. Um, thanks. This has all been really interesting. I just wanted to quickly add um, to what Mark's kind of already said, um, but just there's a lot of talk about quality, which I think is really important. Um, but especially for smaller companies, it feels a little bit like an added financial pressure, um, especially in time where there's not a lot of companies have lost a lot of money. Um, so just to say, I think there's a difference between quality of art and quality of camera or quality of picture. Um, so I think we can still create kind of this, um, this quality art without having to worry too much about not having the newest camera or um, having that equipment. Thank you. Thank you for that point. Joe. Um, it's been really interesting uh, because my head is not in the, f in, 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 in performance right now it's completely in education so this is actually a really breath of fresh air which takes me away and kind of inspires me to to think a little bit differently about what, what we're doing i'm really interested in continuing the learning conversation and this shared online space for learning and and, and how that is broken down into really flexible manageable tools for people to actually use whatever that um but um yeah thank you right um, Lee, and then we'll go to Kate. So if you, uh, the two Kate, so if you prep yourself to hit your mute button. Uh, yeah, two things that I've got kind of swirling around from, from all of that is yeah, about dialogue with audiences and, um, you know, replicating audiences. And I think it was great to hear some of their ideas about like, you know, in chat conversations and, you know, online reactions to, to live performances, even if they're pre-recorded, um, and that, that experience. Um, and then the thing that like, kind of leads me to and has been very present for me is about the idea of creating work, like all these amazing conversations about releasing videos and, you know, work that's already been created um, is great and it's really important that we get that right. But like the thing that is very present for me, I mean, in part because I'm in the middle of making work is about not feeling like the circus as like an industry stalled through this whole period, you know, in, in, in the slightly dystopian, you know, image where this is our present and our, our, you know, how, how life is now. It's like, well, we can't, you know, about not being stuck in that, you know, watching the same shows over and over because that, that's <laughs> the history of today, but carrying on making work, um, which is, is really present for me. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you, Lee. Um, I think Francesca also wanted to have that conversation too. So we will create a space to talk about creating. Fantastic. Kate. Kate Webb. Which one? Kate Webb. Um, oh, yeah. Brilliant conversation. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, lots of thoughts. First of all is that, you know, circus is always adapted and this is a, a great opportunity to, to, to adapt again. Um, I'm, I'm very conscious because I work for a circus school of how we're training, um, you know, the next generation and what we're, what we're training them for. Um, so having lots of conversations about diversifying the offer and um, thinking about, um, yes, creation on digital platforms, but also the relationship between um, the digital platform and the live platform. I do think that if and when we do come out of this, there's going to be such a hunger and a thirst for live performance that as, <laughs> as an industry, how we, how we grasp that, I'm certainly gagging for it. Um, so, and then also thinking about all those things, um, I can't remember who said it, I think it was Francesca, about, you know, as members of the circus industry, those things that, that we have, like our, our resilience and our flexibility and our adapting, and um, those are really, you know, I think those are things to lean back on. But yeah, great conversation, thank you. Thank you, Kate. Kate Hartock. Um, I don't think I've got much to say. Thank you. That was really, um, really lovely to do. Um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all about the live. I'm looking forward to getting back to live. There was some research done quite recently saying that out of, you know, the spectrum of things that people will do with their kind of maybe their leisure time um, coming out of the crisis that going into a, a, a theatre space and watching a show will be one of the last things that people will feel safe doing. Um, so obviously thinking around other ways of doing it are, are welcome and what Circus is really good at doing anyway, I think. Um, yeah, I, I will probably be doing a survey at some point with artists and programmers, so it'd be great to get in touch with people. Fantastic. Charlie, and then we're going to go to uh, Nicole, Sherry, uh, Lynn. Um, yeah, it was so fun to hear about Circa Media, the local stuff, because that was, I, my parents have moved into a different area, and so I don't actually know where I'm living now, which has been really fun for me to explore all this. Um, but I wonder if I was, in, you know, in a place where I knew the people and things like that, how, how that would change. Um, and that's a lovely idea because we are just spending so much time now within a mile radius of us and everyone's in the same position as that. So that's, that's put some food in here. So thank you for that. So, yeah. Thank you, Charlie. Um, Hi, thanks so much for letting me be involved. It's really interesting. Um, I think it's interesting to see how the culture of how we consume live art and performance is going to change and how that's going to carry forward if we're all going to develop habits of enjoying being on the sofa watching shows and I think these things that you will come up with are really exciting as well that support live performance and um, live classes that's really exciting and I just wanted to pipe up with people working with youth and uh, youth circus and stuff and how to keep staying involved with um, communities that you want to reach just um, all the community organizations are still running and we can kind of pipe through them to distribute um, our work and or just you know get get the kids involved that we want to communicate with but great work everyone well done thank you <laughs> Sherry and then Lynn, Rachel, and then finally Kat. Um, thank you, everyone. It was lovely to meet you. Some of you have met in passing in my time with the company, but it's been great to hear oh, your thoughts at length. What? Sorry, oh, Vicky's, it Vicky's. And um, uh, it's been interesting uh, because getting to grips for me, you know, with learning what's particular and special about circus is the first time I'm working in it. And it's the sense of, um, it's been spoken about in terms of the liveness and the risk and what I think was it Marcus said the suspension of disbelief that it's actually happening in front of you it's it's really interesting to get to grips with how you what you can make of that and how you can take it into another realm and also just under my experience of other art forms and, and as we're all now experiencing things online the fascinating thing really is, is when you go, I've been to some live events that people can access those events from all parts of the world where they never would have had access to that before. And so expanding our audiences in those ways, how can we, um, what can we bring of that to this process is, is because there's just so many, there's so many people out there who could be seeing our work who would never have seen it when we've been in our touring circuit of summer festivals um, in the UK and Europe, people everywhere who might want to see our work. Thank you. Lynn? Hi, Ed. Um, I totally agree with Kay. It's about adaptability and how we can make things work where we are now um, and looking at stuff as just taking opportunities. So um, what Double Take and Mark were saying about quality, uh, producing quality content, I think is really good really interesting and I think one of the reasons parkour and extreme sports have been so successful with young people is the amount of digital content they've produced you can go you know you can just watch so much really good stuff online of people doing amazing things and I think if the circus world can produce more content like that maybe we can inspire lots more young people to join in um, and that yeah that I think that might be one way of getting more more kids who are sat at home thinking you know i'm bored and i need something to do maybe, you know maybe that'll inspire them to try stuff in the future which is uh, right 
But yeah, lovely to see everybody. Thanks very much, Vicky, for getting it together. Thank you, Lynn. Rachel, um, Pat, and then Amelia. Well, thanks so much for convening this. It's been my first big conversation in a month, so I've really enjoyed seeing old and new faces. Um, but I, the one thing I just wanted to say is I don't think there is going to be a going back to normal. Someone mentioned that earlier on. I, I think that the future is all going to be informed by this period. Um, and I suppose I feel that we need to really repurpose and really take advantage of the things that we've learned in this period and sort of plan for <clears throat> future innovation, which are you know, really drawing on things that have come up in this period. And I suppose the thing about the, that I've taken from this um, conversation is about the issue of quality. <coughs> so, um, the issue of quality and the idea of knowledge and how can we develop digitally as a sector? because we have a lack of infrastructure in circus. This is one of the main things that's come out of the circus snapshot research. Um, and so there's a lack of infrastructure in comparison to theater or dance, say, for example. And I think that we really have a need for that kind of, um, and also to have increased recognition and increased support, not just financial, but also in, in terms of funding and within, within the sector as a whole, that we, it's like a circle, we also then need to have good in order to achieve that. So I just think this has opened up a really interesting dialogue about um, the future, where we, where we can go. Thank you, Rachel. I know we, we have become very used to being resilient and adaptable. And sometimes I think that doesn't serve us in terms of people wanting to come in and support us as a sector. But anyway, um, Kat. Oh, she's might be gone. Um, Amelia, I'm going to come to you and then hopefully Kat will be back by the time. She just blinked. Secondary. Um, oh, is Kat back? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Okay, do you want to go for it while you're here? Yeah, okay. Well, then I'll just email you. Um, yeah, thank you for hosting Upswing. This has been really great and lots of thoughts churning around now. The main one for me is around um, the audience, the online audience and who they are um, and what their needs are. Um, so, can you still hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, no, I can't. No, I can't. <laughs> but you've frozen into a. Let's let's get Kat to email her thoughts. I felt like it was going to be really good. <laughs> <laughs> Amelia. Okay, yeah. So I think my stuff is very similar to it's is in line with what a lot of people have said, and I think I would. Um, chuck this into three questions that I don't know if there are answers to yet. So one is, what is our goal? which I think is a subjective question, uh, and it is going to depend on who you are and what you do. Um, but, you know, like, you know, like Rachel said, there isn't such thing as a normal anymore, and I'm not sure there ever was one. Um, and right now people are kind of desperate to keep doing stuff. So we're chucking stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks, which I think is fine. But if this does become a regular situation, I do think we need to figure out a, a, a kind of structure like what why are we doing it what is what does it serve other than to just continue to be present um and within that i have um as is my usual sort of who gets to come along for the ride so i mean that in terms of performers uh other kind of company people so technicians who might be out of jobs right now audience members um and that is in line with uh, what Lizzie said about, you know, low income families, because suddenly the move to digital requires you to have equipment that means you can access the digital. And if you don't have money, that becomes harder. Uh, but also for a lot of disabled people, in some ways, this becomes easier. In some ways, this becomes a lot harder. Um, and then as a performer, so my medium is aerial. I don't have a garden. I don't have a rig. I am doing, I have a pull-up bar. <laughs> That's my training right now. So do I even still do aerial anymore in this realm? Because I can't train. Um, so there's that kind of stuff. And then the final thing is just, 
I thought about um, archiving and we've meant, we've talked around, you know, like archival footage and quality, but there's something about digital meaning that we have a chance to archive our work in a way that we've never done before. And thinking in particular about minoritized groups, so disabled people, for example, where our um, archival stuff tends to not get saved in the same way as some other stuff does. Like we have a chance to push for a shift in what it means to archive stuff. Um, and I think that's just a really interesting thing to think about. And thank you. <laughs> Great. Unmute. I'm unmuted. Um, so we, we missed Kat's feedback, but she's going to email um, and we'll make sure that we circulate that. It's been really, really great to have this conversation. I know that we've overrun a little bit, so I'll be really quick rounding up. Um, there's so much that's come out of this. Um, we will save this recording and we'll be sharing it digitally so other people can follow this conversation. I'm sure it's going to spark their own conversations around this. But I also want to be able to come back to this space and kind of move forward some of the things that are identified as talking points um, for the future. And I'm definitely going to come back to people to hopefully ask you to come into this conversation. Um, Upswing are facilitating this. It's all stuff around things that we're preoccupied with and want to talk about. But the space isn't just for our voice, it's for a community voice. So I want to, you to invite you as we think about the next topics to get involved in organizing um, what they might be. But this format feels like it's a good format for discussion. Um, does, how does that work? How did it work for you guys? Cool. So we will come back to you, Mark, double take. I'll be contacting you about um, the digital conversation and hopefully other people will want to join in on that. If you have other thoughts, please email us. And thank you so much. Um, stay well, everyone. And until the next time. Thank Everyone. you. Bye. 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 Bye.